Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Carl Uva Kanaskar, author of In the Land of the Cyclops, published today by Archipelago a lovely press with beautiful books, and they were kind enough to send me a pristine copy to read. Any introduction of Carl Uva is supposed to discuss 3,600 pages, controversy about the title of his sixth volume, My Struggle, and how famous he has become, <clears throat> and that one out of 10 Norwegians own his books. But I will skip all of that uh, if you don't mind. So welcome, Carl Uva. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, the hooded crow, which sits proudly in the center of the cover, is the most intelligent bird of all. It sits proudly amongst 36 other types of birds in the royal palace in Oslo. Why did you happen to choose it as your cover photo by, I assume your friend, but someone you're very familiar with, uh, Stephen Gill? Well, it certainly wasn't because of the intelligence. I didn't know that. Uh, no, it, it was because of uh, Stephen Gill's uh, photos and his photo book, uh, The Pillar. We were neighbors in Sweden and I knew about his, his project. He, he um, had a pole in the ground and wanted to draw birds down from the sky. That was his project. And every time a bird landed on the, on the pillar, uh, it, it was automatically uh, taken photo of and he made a series and an incredibly incredibly intriguing and interesting book uh, came out of that uh, and I think all of the images of birds in that book is uh, is something special because you see the birds as they are with no humans and kind of without a human gaze it's sometimes it's just bits and pieces of them and then sometimes it's post postures you haven't seen a bird in and it's like like he's opening up a world and in the land of Cyclops, it's very much a book about um, visual art and f photos. And, and I also write about Stephen Gill's pictures in the book. So to me, it was a, a kind of a, 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 an easy pick to, to have that. And it's a very, very uh, cool picture in itself. We're kind of iconic, I think. Yes, very much so. And staying on the, before we get into the book, staying on the cover of it. Why did you choose out of all the 37 essays in your book, the Cyclops essay, because it seems to be the only truly angry, perhaps condescending essay in the entire book. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that is true. And, and I think generally all essays in the books are searching for something. They start out without knowing anything. It's by looking at an artwork or a photo or reading a book and they don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're looking for. They're just looking. And then, then that's how the essays are kind of written. Uh, so they're very curious and, and want to find something out. But in that essay, it's very different. It's, uh, it's, it's written by a very angry uh, writer very defensive of being under attack and finally had had it and, and replies, which you never should do to criticism, but I did. Uh, and I knew everything. So it's not I'm not searching for anything. I just want to express that um, defense, really. And, and But the title in itself, in the land of the Cyclops, I, I, I do like. And the land of the Cyclops in the book is Sweden. And I lived in Sweden throughout the period I wrote all of this, all of these essays. So they're kind of letters from the land of Cyclops, all of them. So, yeah, that was why I ended up with that title. At first, I thought the uh, Cyclops were from my country, from America, because yeah, I, think, yeah. I think we have more Cyclops per square meter than there are in Sweden, especially today uh, I, all right i won't get started with that <laughs> no no but uh, you have a point i think it's not <laughs> sweden um if we skip back or if we start with a beginning essay about 
which it begins with the visible vintage, uh, visages of Jesus, starting with a testicular image. Uh, and then you have a photo of clouds, and it always reminds me of the, the biologist Stephen Jay Gould, because in all of our life, it's like a Mandela, it's like a wheel. And every once in a while, there is a coincidence that you do see Jesus in a pair of testicles. But how many times do you not <laughs> see mm. Jesus in a pair of testicles? And um, it seems as if you're discussing the nature of reality as you are in much of the book. But I couldn't quite grasp whose reality we're talking about. And if mm. there is one at all. Yeah, um, I wrote that essay to a book by Thomas Wogström. He's a photographer too. And he took photos of clouds and only clouds, many different clouds uh, throughout the book. Uh, and I got the task to write about the clouds and write about the photos. And um, I did that this many years ago now. <laughs> And I think what interested me is is what we can see and what we can perceive of what's around us, uh, which is of course is the visual and and the sounds and and that we are tuned into. For instance, the the, the clouds we can see that change and we can see them you know, get different shapes and it's part of part of our time. And then you have other elements in nature that also change and also kind of constantly uh, become something else but we can't see it because it's in a different time scale than than, uh, than our own and and the whole essay is about depiction of the world and what we see and how we see it and very much about the art of photography really what what that is what it is to to fixate something in time uh, and i'm also kind of intrigued by and was interested in what how how the world was seen before f photography and 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 um whether i couldn't even imagine such a thing existed and and so it, i don't know if it's about realism or not realism or it's about uh, yeah well, it, yeah, uh, it I is. is I think, do you you talk about? Well, I, I've interviewed a couple of authors lately who have written books about the nature of human consciousness, and each time I ask them, "What if it's simply a solipsistic universe?" And they're always angry because this is their subject, and if it's solipsistic, one of us is not really talking to the other, and it really upsets them mm. and oh but it, and i don't know why it reminds me of this but i would like to, to hear more about and it's not in this essay about the moment of epiphany that you had when you were 16 years old and you were like in the back row of the airplane and i still have a difficult time imagining why i'm able to fly in an airplane and why it works but what was that moment like? Because it does tie into all this. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I mean, I'm sure everyone has those kind of moments where you see something or you understand something all of a sudden and it's very simple, but you just haven't been there. And it's almost impossible to explain afterwards what it was, but it feels very important and very meaningful and in this case it was me flying in Norway as a 16 year old uh, just seeing the world from above and seeing the world as just basically seeing the world and that, that was it it's 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 the, and I connected it immediately with writing and it was kind of a I, I have to write and I have this is the place where it's going to happen somehow in that feeling of the world of of um yeah, it's it is impossible to describe in words really. Uh, but it's, this comes in the end of a very long essay about different kind of 
versions of the world and understanding of the world and 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 and, and it ends up in the sky looking at clouds seeing a kind of totality the whole of the world some very a very intense feeling of belonging i think and the interesting thing is that the only way to get that feeling is to be outside of it so you don't really belong when you f- have the feeling of belonging because you see it with a distance and that's also kind of a subject matter in the essay arts that it pulls you in but to 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 do it and to to read it and to see it 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 also always requires a distance so that the, f- the feeling of to of, of the existence the, the the feeling of being is is very much part of what art is about and it requires a distance also always it's interesting that you say you don't really you can't really explain why it's an epiphany or why you feel that way do you want to hear an epiphany that i had yeah so i was in college at the university of florida very warm and there's a little lizard that lives there called a chameleon and um i used to like picking them up you could rub them on their bellies and they would fall asleep. But I had one in my hand and he opened his mouth and a spider walked out. Mm. It was, yeah. I, it, I knew it was going to be his meal, but when he opened his mouth and the spider walked out, I realized, I don't know, something, mm. something that was very important to me, but I could never put it into words. Yeah, but just it. We're not talking about me. We're trying to sell your book today. Oh, it's, so, and going to that, it's sometimes in your book, it seems as if there's a bit of Sartre uh, in it because of nausea. And it seems as if sometimes, in addition to denigrating your to- yourself from time to time, that you seem as if there's just too much. And the too much makes you feel not bad, but it makes you feel like there's just too much. Like when he looks at the roots of the tree and it's just too much essence. And it seems that from time to time you feel that way. It's just there's too much and it's too too earthy. You use the word earthy, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I have actually never read Sartre, but I'm familiar with with that book, Nausea. Um, I never read it. Um, I think um, what I'm interested in very much, and I think almost all of the essays somehow touches into that, is um, the feeling, the the wish to, the feeling of that the world is ordered and 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 in a certain way in a in a certain things are positioned in a certain way we f- are feeling we're kind of controlling our feelings and and our views of the world through a hierarchy for instance um things that can't go together uh things that doesn't you know um it, and it's very strict uh, and um, and it's not subconscious, but we we are not aware of it. Uh, it's just the way the world the world appears. And many artists often transgress those kind of that strictness that we are not aware of. So you can see it. So, for instance, I'm very interested in Cindy Sherman. I wrote about her in some of her really grotesque photos photos that they're really grotesque and I'm trying and it's like you almost want to vomit when you see them and I try to to find out why and it is it is the transgression and and and, and when something are transgressed again you see it from the outside and you see it you step kind of out of the the, the more mechanic way of seeing things and you see something else which also is true and that's always what I'm looking for in art and also in reading. It is transgression and it is kind of go outside of the patterns that you, that you always are in. And, and, and that pull is, is central in, in the book, I think. 
Yes, but you also say that there's a certain allure juxtaposed with the repulsion. And I know what you mean because I do feel that. But what does allure mean? I'm sorry. Um, an attraction. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. That's yeah. almost a sensual attraction. Yeah, yeah. Because you, a transgression will also mean a, a, something that goes, you go out of your thoughts or out of your that kind of approach to the world and, and much more emotional or physical and primitive, you could say. So one yeah. of the essays is, about, for instance, uh, it's about necks, which kind of is the place where where the, the head and the body is, is connected. And there is a certain, yeah, that has to do with that as well. Uh, a kind of, it's not a longing for that at all, but it's it's realizing that we also are animals, for instance, and we are, you know, and, 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 and what's that? Those kind of things I, I do write about. I like the way that the first thing you say about necks is you immediately think of decapitating them. Yeah, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, it doesn't, it's, yeah, you say it, you always, they talk about every part of the body. But then when you look at the pictures, and then I looked at every picture on the web that was done, the, some of the necks are beautiful, and then some of them are grotesque. But yeah. some of the women's necks, but it all, that, that grotesquery, the grotesqueness and the allure reminds me of what you're criticizing in the Cyclops. Because she does these pictures that are so disgusting, I'm sure there's some conservative, fundamentalist Christians and find them disgusting. And just as in your book where you have a 26-year-old teacher who falls for a 13-year-old girl and has sex with her, and, and then they assume that that's you. They assume that you're a pedophile. They assume that you're a Nazi. They assume all these things. And that's what you're saying. You're saying, no, it's not. This is what I'm writing about. That's all it is. Yeah. And, and, and so a lot of these pig pictures, I think, would create the same reaction in people. This is disgusting. Why would she do something like this? I'm not going to show this to my children. You know, that same kind of response. And, you know, for yeah. what it's worth. Yeah. But that's exactly what those pictures try to escape from is morality, you know, and, 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 and judgment. And they try to just, they just juxtapose things that shouldn't be together. That's it. And it's, it's plastic. It's not real. It's, it's, and, 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 and that's exactly what I want to transgress is, is, and they show us what's in our gaze, what's in our view, what's in us and what's in the world. The world is, there's no moral in the world, you know, it's not, doesn't exist. It's only in us and the way we look at things. And, and I think, I don't think literature should be kind of free of moral. That would be completely stupid, but it's, it's the place where, where you could examine it and where you could kind of explore it and where you could open it up and where it could be, you know, where things are many things are possible at the same time and that's called complexity and 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 what you are referring to is not complex it's the opposite and it comes of course of fear for the complexity and and and, and yeah yeah so. and it's like when you're comparing it to bodily fluids that they're here but yet yeah. if they're in the wrong context whether it's feces or urine or semen we're going to look at them as being disgusting yet they're part of our own essence. Yeah, it's yeah. stupid. Uh, one of the funniest things in the book, which is when you talk about in the essay, Fate, um, how when someone, it, right before I read that, I had this dream. Mm. And I told my girlfriend the dream. And mm. I, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was interesting. And then I read your essay and I went, oh, that was horrible. Why did I tell her it was so boring and distasteful? And But then you, after you say this, then you tell the dream. And yeah. then you tell it in two more essays, you tell the dream. And I'm wondering, are you, you know, why didn't you take your own advice and not tell the dream? Yeah, that's a good question. It was a good dream. 
And, and I do think the worst is even worse than people telling you dreams are, are literary dreams. I mean, that's that's something. But, but, but then now in, in my new novel, uh, I'm actually writing several literary dreams. So there's no... <laughs> There's no rule without exception. No, but this was the phenomenon of, of dreaming, really, what it is, and 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 if you could, what fate is, and what, and if you can foresee something in the future, which is which is what dreams always has been associated with, and that's what op- opens it up. So, yeah, yeah, it's like uh, you tell can, a dream. <laughs> but you compare the interest that you find if you watch a David Lynch movie, say like Blue Velvet. And it's basically dreamlike, but it doesn't bore you. It excites you. It brings you in because even though it's a dream, it's presented in a different fashion. And that's the way I've always felt about those types of movies. But another thing that was interesting and goes directly to your life and how you've presented your entire life to the world without, I, you know, not to make you sound like a hero, but without fear, you know, in six volumes, it could have been 12 volumes. When I looked at Woodman's pictures and you discussed the first and the polka dots with the polka uh, the uh, circles that some are big, some are small. And you say, it's almost as if she's saying, go on, look at me. And then I thought, isn't that what you do? Isn't that exactly what you do? I think the only way I could look at a photo or a work of art and write about it is through myself, my own experience. And, and, and that's the only way I can go. Uh, and in Woodman, of course, the interest is av- awoken b- because of that, because of what just what she did. And I'm also amazed that she was so young when she did it. And I actually write about that, what I would have been able to do when I was that age. It would have just not have been possible at all, you know. So it's and it's and it has such a freshness to it. So it is very youthful, but still somehow sophisticated, even in its simplicity. So yeah, I think you're right. I never thought of that, that that's what those books are doing uh, that I wrote. But of course it is it is a certain it must have been. That's why I'm looking, thinking that when I when I see her, because it comes from my own experience somehow. I don't know, but probably yeah. Yeah, and the, the thing, is, the people who have don't know of her that are listening to this, she died by her own hand when she was only 22, and to just think, whatever I was doing when I was 22 was not that that I would would not be capable of that kind of self-examination or exploration, there's no way. But um, there, is it, a, there is a certain recklessness in it too. And, and, and that's, that's yeah, I think there is a certain, it's not exactly violence, but it is, there is a recklessness in, in just the project and it feeds the, the the intensity and the meaning in in the photos, not what happened to her, but but that kind of energy. So they are incredibly strong, those photos. Yeah, and at first you didn't really seem to like them, and then when you saw them again, you changed your mind completely. And that was interesting as well. So and then you begin to talk about Monet, almost in the same context. Well, do you want to hear another moment of epiphany for me? Yeah. Okay, so I was in Paris and I went to the Angere Museum in the Tuileries Gardens and I sat there on a bench by myself. I traveled by myself and I sat there on a bench looking at one of the water lilies and I think I must have fallen asleep for maybe two or three hours, but it wasn't really sleep. And then when I emerged, there was this woman in the middle of the water lilies looking directly at me. And then I looked away and then I looked back and she was no longer there, which reminds me of the siren that you heard. Did you ever figure out what that siren was? Yeah, many, exactly many months later I did. It's a, it's a, 
it comes every month at a certain time. It's like a, a rehearsal of the, you know, the siren that come if it's war or whatever. So I did find out in the end, but that was after the essay was written. It was funny. But it's <laughs> it's also the, the things are happening and you don't know what it is. That's the feeling in that essay. It was funny because when I was when it was about the Cyclops and other references to Odysseus, I thought, oh, the sirens. <laughs> I thought it was the mm. sirens. <laughs> Well, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's. <laughs> I wish I thought of that, but I didn't. <laughs> Those kind of things oh. happens you write all the time. Well, moving on to what we talked about earlier is Newt Hamsa, and, and and as I said, I was just in my teens when I read Hunger, and it just, I, it changed me, and then I had to read Growth of the Soil. And I don't know if you're familiar with the song by Dire Straits. It's called Telegraph Road. It's yeah. just like you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he just starts out by basically digging a hole and living there while he builds his house, and and then everything comes, and then the lawyers come. That's the one that gets me, since I'm a lawyer as well, um, which is a horrible thing to come, lawyers. Uh, but yeah, when I read The Growth of the Soil, I felt as you did when you described it earlier. It's just, and the funny thing that you say when you described it is that you have to smile. Mm. It's hard to explain that, isn't it? Why are you smiling? It's, um, there is, uh, what can I say? I don't know how to express it in English, but it's 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 um, it, no, I it's one thing is that it's just so good. I mean, I'm a writer, so I, I I I do know good writing when I see it, but it's it's not that because I don't smile when I read, you know, that way when I read Proust or Joyce or whoever, uh, whoever. It is. It's. It's. It's some. It's. I no. I don't really know it. But it is. It is. It happens every time. And it is very joyful. And it is a kind of a. a he has uh, too much of something. I think that comes in in his writing. And it is always. I know. I can't. I can't explain it. So I have to write an essay about it. I think. I, yes. It's funny because I remember you saying in one of the YouTube videos that you don't watch that you hadn't read Finnegan's Wake. That was one. Maybe it was one of the Proust questions. No, but it's funny because we adopted a girl from my daughter from China, Anna, Antata, um, and we used to lie in bed and we had a. a a reading copy of Finnegan's Wake, and on the cover was a boy blowing a bugle, but it looked like a pretzel. And so she called the book Pretzel Boy. <laughs> and um, and we would just open it to the middle, and she would read it. Because if you're a young person, you can read it, because they aren't yeah. words. But you have to do it with an Irish accent, which she couldn't do. Because you have to read it aloud with an Irish accent, otherwise there's nothing. But you can pick it up anywhere. And it doesn't really make any difference. No. So I, I can't say that I've read it all, but that was one of a very enjoyable thing for me. Yeah. So. And uh, one, one of the things in one of the essays, uh, I guess at the bottom of the universe, don't you feel really sorry for those guys in the ice? Yeah. That'd be it's horrible. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> Really? Yeah, so what I'm talking about is Dante's comedy when he sees, will you tell the story? He sees the guy in the ice that he knows, and he's, it's the only time he's really violent in the book. Yeah. Uh, tell that a little bit, if you can. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really weird thing because it's, um, don't is when he's traveling down in hell and up the heavens he he's observing and um 
he's not active in that way and, and then all of a sudden and he's the protagonist and he's the one who wrote it and then and it didn't happen i mean it it's a it's a work of fiction so then he, he goes down closer and closer to hell and it gets colder and colder and because that's the nature of of dante's hell that that it is the bottom is frozen then they see a lake uh with frozen water and and we see the heads above the lake heads, heads and heads and heads and heads and and you can hear the dead teeth i don't know what you say in english but this kind of clacking or you know yeah. Because they, they are freezing, and that's that's where they are. So, that, so it's frozen. It's no life. It's it's as below zero as as, as life can, can get. Uh, it's no movement. And there's no nothing is possible. Uh, it's frozen. And if you are familiar with, you know, in life, that's the worst condition of all: is not to be able to move, to be frozen, like in a total depression, for instance, or or you know. So it's we are going into that kind of hell. And there he's kind of overwhelmed with rage with one of the one of the heads that he recognized. And he I, I don't remember what he do exactly, but I think he kind of takes his hair and and, and maybe he kicks him, but it is violent towards him. And and it's it's such a incredibly strong moment in that book because it, it is almost transgressing the rules in in what have happened otherwise and i kind of speculating why what is this what, what's what's happening here and and i don't know but it's it's a very interesting point in 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 the book um, especially because he it wasn't like he described something that happened to him he's, he invents this so that's that's a kind of a vital vital thing in the book the, the word is uh chattering that, okay yeah or shivering it's, but it's so Chattering. Yeah, the, what captured me when I first read Dante, I was that was I was studying literature when I was nineteen twenty, and and we read it. Um, that was the the visuality of it, and it, it is always that that kind of, and this image is so striking and it's so good and it's yeah, I mean with all the heads frozen frozen there, and that's 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 hell, and yeah. Another funny and thing about. Written, I didn't, huh? Okay, I didn't. I didn't think of anything when I wrote it, but I obviously was very depressed. And it's snowing outside, and I'm alone in a house, and it's cold, and and somehow that's where my thoughts goes to Dante. And I didn't reflect why. I never do it in the essays or in things I'm writing. I'm just just kind of writing about it, and and then this turned up this scene, and yeah, it's part of something. One of the funny things about your life is that you hate the cold, but you live in a really, really cold place. <laughs> Why don't you move to California or Hawaii or something? But you love Sweden, although you hate Sweden. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I've moved to London, so that's a bit, it's a bit improved, a little bit, not much. Not much. Eight degrees here and gray, but it's, I like it. <laughs> Have you always hated the cold? Um, no, but I found I found really freezing. That's that's you know really that's um, I'm, the most freezing moment I've ever had in my life was when I was in in your country, Michigan and and the North um, Midwest. Um, it was so cold. It was like I didn't know that that it was so cold there. No idea. It's <laughs> it, it was yeah. It's surprising when you look at the lines of latitude and how different the climates can be from the west and the east. Yeah, yeah. And then in that same essay at the bottom of the universe, you do what I was uh, implying earlier, and which is exactly the way I feel about myself. You go, you're nothing but a lousy, <laughs> the way it's translated, you're nothing but a lousy human being, never quite good enough, but you're happy because you're recovering from the moment of you're recovering from dread but it doesn't really it's, it's not that much it's not that it's not good <laughs> you're still just a lousy human being that isn't worth something and my mother who was a wonderful woman one time i was sitting with her and she said to me i wonder why you never did anything with your life mm. she didn't mean anything by it she was just observational yeah but, 
And that's some, that's how I feel. And I have that same voice uh, since I was a little boy, the same mm. voice that tells me this all the time. Yeah. Well, I, you know, once again, I'm talking about myself. I, I do this all the time. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, the other thing you say is that in the same vein is that you say you can't stand intimacy and the, and the distance is inside of you. And in your books, the books of your life, you describe that. But I can't remember why you actually put it in the essay. Which essay is it then? I think it's in... It's still in the bottom of the universe. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Where you you bring that in, that there's some reason why you have to maintain this distance. I don't know either, uh, but I it's that isn't really. A, it's more like a diary, really, than an essay. Yeah, that one is. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So, yeah, and it also could could have been part of. My struggle. I mean, it's 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 not very remote from that. It's close to that than 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 an essay. But I somehow, I yeah, I don't well, know why I bring it in, or I don't know what what, what the essay is about. But it's it it feels like it's you should just read it. It feels like it's connected somehow. But I don't know in in what ways. And I never do that when I'm writing. I just write, see what happens, and hope something happens that I haven't thought of before and and that things that are connected makes me go to a place where I haven't been before uh, so when I when I do start as I said in the beginning of of this is that I don't know where I'm going and when I you know when I start writing an essay for instance about Anselm Kiefer which is in, in there I have no idea what to say and I know what I want to see in, in the pictures and it's all a process of, of it all comes in the writing and writing is a way of thinking that is completely different from my my normal life I don't think much and and I don't reflect much uh, and so that's that's also part of the reason why I'm writing these essays is myself try to understand why some pictures or why some experiences are feel so profound because I don't know you know, and 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 it's kind of a search into how does why I am so affected by this? How does you know? And and in that search, I bring in all kinds of stuff, uh, completely without any criticism, and just hoping that it will, you know, give depth to it somehow. And 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 it's many of the essays are you know purely about the artworks but i often bring in myself and my, my own emotions or my own experiences uh, because that's what i got um and in this essay I, I don't really know why why that's why the things are there but somehow they feel connected and i and, I, and what i did like in it was the, um that's why I, i've written many essays that's not in the collection but, but that has to do with i think the feeling of darkness, the feeling of stillness, the feeling of no motion, no movement, and and then like a dead dead point in 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 a life, uh, and it's snowing and it's and it's someone writing from that position, which is kind of the bottom of the universe position, and then reading Dante, thinking about that, seeing the moon, thinking about that, kind of, it's it's um, and it, it isn't. And no, none of the essays are like this is my view of something. This is how I think something. That would be very boring, I think, for me at least. Uh, it's much more that the writing could lead to something that I really couldn't have said before I started to write, you know. And it's not like I think this is I'm a hundred percent for this. It's much more like the essay is reaching that point and that could be an interesting point maybe things looks different from there so it's it's again it's search for a kind of complexity and if you are a simple person that's in literature you can try but i'm sure i'm sure the simplicity kind of shines through and but it's that's what, what i try to do so knowing why something is there isn't always the best thing for a writer i think well you do have you do insight in that passage because then you do make an exception with regard to your children 
where you do say that that's an exception to that rule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for all good people, that has to be an exception, even if they are distant, even if they are, do have, and there's American English books that all talk about what the fear of intimacy is about and why it exists. Yeah. But it's, it would be very hard. Of course, there are bad parents, but it would be very hard, I think, to not have that feel. Do you have that feeling that when my children are in pain, I would rather take, I'm not a hero and I feel in some ways I'm a coward, but if my children are sick, I would rather take that sickness to myself so that they could feel better. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Do you think if you were in a train station and someone was, a little kid was falling in front of the train, do you think you would jump in and save the child? Uh, I hope so, but you could never know, as you know, how you will react to these extreme situations. Uh, if you will be a coward or if you will be, I, d I don't know really, I hope so. I have a friend, he, he judged people he meets, he thinks, is this a person, if there was a lifeboat and, and, and I was drowning and the boat was full, would it take me or not? That's his way of kind of finding out if people are, his, his method of finding out if people are worth seeing again. Yes, it's like the Titanic or the movies about the Titanic. Yeah. So, you know how you were, re you were just reading that book, The Sense of an Ending? At least you said that on one of the interviews I listened to. You were reading the book, a book called The Sense of an Ending. Yeah. Well, so there's another book called The Sense of an Ending by Julian Barnes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that book is important because it talks about how what we think we did in the past has nothing to do with what we did in the past. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Which goes to your work. Yeah. I mean, you have six volumes about your entire life, the last being basically a, a diary, as you said. And, you know, the question is, which you do bring up several times in this collection of essays is, is the past something that actually exists? Is the past something that you're designed to be the repository of? And um, having written 3,600 3, pages, do you feel as if you've reflected in some ways accurately the past? I think those six books are reflecting in a document about the time it was written and the, the way I looked at the past when it was written. So if I had started writing it now, it would be a completely different book. It would be, be very different. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's an insight I I got afterwards that it it captured times, but it's not the past. It's captured the the the, the present time. It's it's writing actually how the world looked then and how the past looked looked then. So the past is constantly changing as we, as we know. It's it's um, it's not fixed at all. Here's a silly question, because you talk about television and movies and how getting sucked into them. This is an American question. So what do you think about, say, if you've seen them, the Marvel movies like that include <laughs> Thor and Loki? Do you have you seen any of those movies? Um, I'm sorry, but I know my children. Uh, children have and they they love the Marvel films. That's all I know. I haven't seen them. <laughs> <laughs> you should probably watch one. It, that would make a great essay, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny too because. You know, in many in many of your interviews, especially back when you were smoking, you would talk about how you did not like fame. You didn't like the concept of fame or being famous. And yet you are very famous. And what was interesting, you know, I've interviewed like 600 authors. And it, it was so interesting because when I said to people that I would be interviewing you, they were all so excited that I was interviewing Carl Ova. Oh, how terrible. I know. Uh, I don't know, but I mean, yes. That's why I would never listen to this interview. I don't want to hear me talking. It's not a good thing. But, um, yeah, isn't that interesting how that's happened to you? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's um, something I 
I can't kind of afford even to think about, so I, I don't think about it. And I've tried to remove all of that as much as possible um, from my you know thoughts. Um, and it has it was very essential when these books start to come out uh, that I did that kind of remove myself from it. But then I have you know you've done a million interviews and and lots of events and talked and talked and talked about this book in in ten years now. So it's it's um, and I'm. So it's kind of weird because I'm a shy person. So if I'm at a dinner party, little private dinner party, I hardly say anything, you know, and 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 hardly talk and and feel, you know, that I'm stupid and don't have anything to say and I can't say anything about this. And then and then I have this book, uh, which is my struggle, which I think was written in kind of a that was very angry and a reaction to to that really to be hiding myself and to always kind of be pleasing and, and not really take any space. I'm sure I did, but, but the feeling I had was was that I didn't. So so it was kind of an explosion being 40, just trying to say exactly how it was the whole the whole life. Uh, and and it was only possible in literature of course, because I had if I had started to talk to someone about it, it would have been incredibly boring and unpleasant after two minutes and then it is the events when i talk about the books which i can do i can sit on stage and talk about it and it's it's just a bit like writing because i never know what to say or where it's going and and then it something new can turn up something new maybe not turn up but it's it's different each time and and it's and it's weird because it's it's um it's supposed to be about literature but it is about also life and and my insights change through those years you know all my thoughts change through those years and the past change so so in the end it's like i'm talking about something completely different than i than i was writing about just because of those 10 years that had passed but i do don't don't want to do that anymore Um, so i do still have to kind of do some interviews when book six is published in somewhere but i try to minimize it the much as much as i can because i do uh, want to, yeah, yeah. But you could have, something else. You could have been like Thomas Pynchon and just said, "No, I'm not going to even reveal myself to the world." Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For, for then you could have, yeah, yeah. Done that. I kind of wanted that when I when I wrote the ending of my struggle that I don't want. I'm so happy I'm no longer a writer. That was what I wanted, and then I just didn't manage at all. I started to write again, and I. And I continued that kind of life uh, for many years, um, but I don't think about it. It's not like it's like uh, it's so different from my ordinary life, and and it's it, uh, very hard to relate to my life. Really, it's like something that happened to someone else. Really, it's weird, and especially since it's in in essence very personal. Then it's weird when it's like it's happening to someone else. You know, it's like it has nothing to do with me. It's just something out there, and and I'm happy here, and and I hope you know, yeah. There's no there's no direct connection anymore for me with the books I'm in. It's funny. A long time ago, you were interviewed by uh, Charlie Rose, and he asked you that question about whether you were happy, and you said. You well, at first you weren't sure, and then you said that happiness wasn't as important as work. The work was more important than happiness, which is kind of what you're saying now. I think maybe I don't know. Um, no, it's not. It's not the same. Uh, it was a long time ago. It was before you had children. I think maybe. No, I couldn't have, I must have had children, but it's, um, no, but I've, I don't think in those terms about work, life anymore, it's, um, it's, I did many years ago and I did when I, when I wrote my struggle, it's a lot about that. 
about writing and having children, having ambitions, having children, all of that, uh, that was important. And it was part of the reason I was writing it, I think. Um, and it's a, it's a common thing. I mean, Virginia Woolf wrote about those kind of things, a room of one's own, and, and that's kind of part of it. But not now, it's completely gone from my way of thinking, really. So, I mean, I think that's what I'm, I think I'm writing books, publishing books. I'm father to five children, I live here in London. It's, it's, it's life, you know, it's, and it's, it's, um, yeah, don't think, don't think in those terms. And I don't, yeah, I just, and I just want to do that to, to, to continue publishing book and continue being, being in, in the family. And that's it, basically. So I think you are happy, even though yeah. you, yeah, that's cool. No, no, and I know, and I know if I am unhappy, I know, I know, I know where to go and what to do to, to, uh, to be happy. And I didn't then, I was much more much more angry and much more confused then. But that's, I don't know what that is, but it's also kind of, it's very, very different having your first child and having now like a, a big family, many children uh, that are all ages. And, and it's, um, yeah, it's, I think of that period as incredibly mature and, and <laughs> And, but also very necessary. I mean, it's it's like life is falling over you, and you have to deal with it. And and you have what you have. You can't do it in any other way that that you are doing basically. And and that teaches you a lot. And 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 yeah. But but you know, I, when I was young, I thought writing was kind of a sacred thing, and I, and and kind of a elevated. Um, yeah. And I thought it has to be done in complete isolation. So I, I did, I isolated myself and I did, you know, rented house on an island and, and rented a lighthouse and I was writing and I wasn't really writing. It was it was kind of a dead, dead thing. And I never written so much since I got children and family and, 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 and it's, and thinking about writing as just something ordinary, just something, doing nothing special. That's just a, way of being really and, and and that helps also the writing in terms of doesn't matter if it's good or bad or it's just a, just being in it that's important well that's a good way to end on happiness i think so uh, as you may know that i have an independent bookstore today's the publication of your book it'll be sitting on the front table and i mean well if we did it by video i would show it like that because it's such a beautiful cover and they do such a good job don't they and it's such a yeah it's, incredible so thank you so much for doing this and bearing with me i really appreciate it um, thank you very much it was a having pleasure. Me. anyway it was a pleasure meeting you very nice talking to you thank you very much you're okay. welcome thank you